Lauren, see ya. Lauren Drace, yep. Olivia? Lonnie? Chelsea? Michael? Michael Freed? Vince? Michael Gargano? Tian? Charlie? Yating? Maddie? One second. Where's Wei? Oh, okay, cool. All right. You guys are sitting next to each other. I didn't, I didn't see your head. And then when your ting said here, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, Maddie? Jeremy? Lorenz? Corey? Una? Jacob? Matt Miles? So we got Matt G, Matt Miles. Emma? Julie? Allie? Samuel told me he's not going to be here. Corin told me she's not going to be here. Isabella? Jordan? Zach? And your fan. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Let me put the projector on. All right, I made um, an announcement over Canvas. Hey. Okay, under announcements, I made an update to the course plan. So I just wanted to share this tonight so you so we're all on the same page. Let's see what's gonna happen for the rest of the uh, semester. So here we are for tonight. I'm going to cover chapter seven and eight in Excel. Okay. This is what I wanted you to have due tonight, but I realized um, a few days ago that I did not assign a chapter five homework. So I made it due on Sunday. Okay. Um, I was like, shoot, I didn't assign it. So this is, this is what we're doing tonight. This is what the rest of the semester is going to look like. Okay. This is available to you in Canvas under announcements, okay? So um, for next week, you have to do chapter seven and eight simulation, chapter seven and eight homework, and you have to do the tech in action, chapters three and 13. All right, next week, we're gonna get into access. Yes. or not okay um all right I'll, I'll have to troubleshoot that because like i said i explained to you guys I've, I've been taking assignments from dr hortano and working with what he has so yeah i know i just couldn't go in and like redo it no okay i'll i'll, I'll adjust from there okay. okay um yeah like i clicked on it through canvas like it's you can go in through there but then to like make corrections i couldn't find it okay to make okay, so like it didn't upload to um like it wasn't when I go in through Pearson, it's not like on the to do list. Okay. Okay. After I do the lecture I'll I'll dig into it. Okay. okay? All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um 
So next week is going to be Access, Chapter 1. The 15th is your second exam. We're going to cover, that's going to be on Chapters 5, 7, and 8. Okay. Um, you can also see here during um, Thanksgiving break, you will have to turn in Second Action 9 and 10, and you'll have to do ch Quiz 4 as well. Okay. Um, when we get back, I'm going to cover Access Chapter 2 and Access 3. And then your final exam and your last exam will be Exam 3, and it will be on Access Chapters 1 through 3. Okay. Um, that's on the 13th. It's on a Thursday, just like tonight. Okay. Um, and that will bring us to the end of the semester. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna have to come in? No. Okay. No. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the exams just like I did exam one. Release it to you. And you all work on it. You know, do your own work because you'll have to we're checking everything meticulously, you know. And we'll keep it like that. All right? Any other questions? So tonight, I'm going to cover two chapters, okay? Chapter 7 and 8, and then uh, we're going to do the audio PowerPoints. I'm going to go over the PowerPoints myself first, and then show you the audio PowerPoints. I'm sorry, sir, what's your first name? Uh, Jack. Jack. Uh, Brayton Buck? Yeah. All right. All right, Chapter 7, Specialized Functions Using the Date, Logical, Lookup, Database, and Financial Functions. Right. Tonight, we're going to use the date function. Some of you are already familiar with the date function because you, you used it um, for uh, one of the questions on the exam, okay? Um, we're going to move on to talk about creating a nested lo logical function using the advanced lookup functions, uh, applying a advanced filtering, manipulate manipulating data with database functions, using financial functions, and cr creating a loan amortization table. Right, we're going to also talk about date functions using the year fraction function, the days function, using date, year, and month functions, and other date functions. All right, Excel's date and time category includes a variety of date and time functions. You can see here, for those who are talking, please lower your voice because I can hear your, your vibrations of your vocal cords. All right. <laughs> um, so days calculates the number of days between two dates. Here's the formula, equal sign, days, and here are the arguments, the end date and the start date. You can see an example of that formula here. It's equal days B2. As you see, B2 has 930, 2018. B1 for the second argument for the, the start date which is 9-1, and Excel reports back 29 because there's 29 days between the 30th and the 1st of September, okay? The year frac formula calculates the fraction of a year between two dates, okay? Here we have equals year frac, and here are the arguments, start date, comma, end date. Pretty um, self-explanatory um, these functions. Um, here in the example, we have equals year frac, open parentheses, E1, where you see the start date of 1 1 2015. And the second argument is E2, which is 6 30 2018. And it says the fraction of that year is 3.5. Okay.
Now to Excel time and date functions. All right, these are additional time and date functions. Day displays the day. Okay, here's the argument equals day, serial number. So right here is an argument. Here's, here's an example of the formula is equal day, open, open parentheses B1. And in B1, we have 9-1-2018, and Excel reports back 1, because it's the first date of the month. Same deal with the, with the month um, formula, equals month, open parentheses, serial number. In this example, we have B1, and it shows us the ninth month, and so on for the year. Pretty simple formula functions with simple arguments. Now we're going to move on to talking about creating a nested logical function. Okay, the skills include including I'm um, creating a nested if function using the and function, nesting an and function, and nesting an or or a not function. All right, a nested function is a function that's embedded within an argument of another function. All right. Um, you all learned about the if logical function in earlier chapters, and that enables you to test two outcomes of a situation. Uh, what happens if you have three or more outcomes? All right, so this is where a nested logical function comes into play. When you need to test more than two outcomes. So here in this example, on this slide, I have last names, titles, higher date, and salary, and a bonus amount. And up here, you'll see higher, if the person's hired before this date, they get a 9% bonus. If they're hired, or, I mean, hired on or before this certain date, they get 5%, or if they're hired after this date, they get 3%. You know, there's uh, several outcomes here. So, this figure here, it's a flow chart and it shows you the logic behind making the correct determination. So if hired before 1 1 2010, if true, then increases they get a, their salary multiplied by 9% for the 9% bonus. If false, then the next the, the next logical test would be if they're hired on or before um, 1 1 2015, if true, multiply by 5%. If not, multiply by 3%, okay? This figure is just to show you an illustrated example of how nested, how nested, um, nested logic works, okay? So here we have it now, that same example written out in the formula. All right, so we're using the if statement here, so we're going to say equals if, open parentheses, if C7 is less than C absolute, value 2, then multiply D7 by D2, which is where we are right here. If not, if not multiplied in C7, I'm sorry, then the next test would be if C7 is less than or equal to C3 then multiply D7 by D3. If not, multiply D7 by D4. Okay. It's kind of hard to, to show you that formula without seeing the actual spreadsheet. But you see, you know, C7 has a higher date. D7 has a salary. And D2 has the, uh, the bonus percent, okay? So this is how a nested if statement would look. Now we're gonna talk about nesting and or or the not functions, okay? Um, the and accepts two or more logical tests and displays true if all conditions are true or false if any of the conditions are false. The OR function evaluates to true 
if any of the conditions are true and returns false only if all the conditions are false and not evaluates only one logical test and reverses the truth of the logical test. So here's the argument. Here's a formula right here equals n, and the arguments are logical test one, logical test two, logical test three, or or again evaluates to true if any of the conditions are true. Okay, remember and is if all the conditions are true, and or is if any of the, the conditions are true. All right, they both have the same argument. All right, equals or, open parentheses, logical one, logical two, logical three, et cetera. And not, it reverses the truth of the logical test, which is one argument there, equals not, and then you put your logic. All right, this slide right here shows the, um, the um, an example of the and function as it's used here in column E, and so we have and open parentheses B5, so we have B5 right here, so which is the title column. If B5 equals manager, all right, and then also they're looking to see if D5 is less than E2 or 70,000. All right, see you, Ryan. So this function here is looking for people who are managers and they make less than 70,000. All right, now we're gonna talk about advanced lookup functions, including the lookup field and using um, the index function and the match function. All right, you learned about VLOOKUP already, okay? Um, some of you got a little mixed up with uh, using an F statement versus VLOOKUP for one of the exam questions. Um, another lookup, uh, other lookup functions that Excel has is what's called index and match. Right here in this slide is an example of the index function. Index returns a value at the intersection of a specified row or column. All right, and here's the, here's the uh, formula equals index, or the function equals index, open parentheses. The first argument is the array, or the range of column, I mean the range of cells. You can see the array example right here. This example is looking for A2 to B5. Sorry, I should put this on. See, A2 to B5. Um, the next argument is row number. In this case, we have three. And that means that the third row in the array you selected, so one, two, three. You see that's why it has this number here, 8,445, because that's the third number in this row, in this array. And then a, and a, and a, um, to follow, the, 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 uh, the last argument is column number, which is an optional argument. Again, always remember, when you're looking at your uh, functions, if you see a square bracket, that means it's an optional argument. And here we have the column number two. And that means the second column, which is the B column. Another lookup function in Excel is match. This searches through a range of, of specific values and returns the uh, relative position and the uh, function is equals match, and it's looking for the lookup value, here in this case, B7. You know, the value that we're looking for is 8,455. And then the second argument is lookup array, as opposed to lookup array was the first argument in the index function. It's the second argument in the match function. And you can see it's a uh, range of cells, so the lookup array is B2 to B5. And then, and then the um, optional argument, which is displayed here, it's zero. All right, for match, there are only three optional arguments, zero, negative one, or one. Zero means ex um, an exact match. So, um, so it displayed it as number three, meaning it's the third 
it matches this number was the third um option in this row of four in this array all right again i'm going to specify i'm going to say again that array when they when they are asking for the lookup array and the match or the index functions are asking for a range of cells and in this example you can see it's b2 to b5 all right now we're going to move on to um, objective four applying advanced filtering um, the skills include creating a criteria and the output ranges and applying the advanced filter. Okay. Um, so you can filter records into a subset of data that meets specific conditions. All right. You already learned a, a good amount about filtering, but you can do this type of filtering is called um, criteria. You can create a criteria. A criteria range is a group of of two or more adjacent cells that specify the conditions used to control the results of a filter. Okay. A criteria range must contain at least two rows and one column where the first row contains the column labels as they appear in the data set. And the second row contains the conditions or the values used to filter the data set. So here in a, in a slide, we have the original data set and we have the criteria range. Okay. The criteria range right here is saying salaries. Well, honestly, it's saying, you know, people who are located in Chicago with the title account rep with salaries greater than 30,000. And below the criteria range is where you will find the filter and the copy results. Okay. And Excel will spit that out here. And as you can see, these are all people with salaries above 30,000. And you all have the title account rep. So yeah, again, um, so here in this example, an additional row has been added to the results to the criteria, well, an additional row has been added to the criteria and the results have increased. All right, um, a third row was created, has created another filter for account reps who live in Atlanta. So as you add more items to your criteria, your filter results will change. All right, so to get to this option here, to the advanced filter. And this this might be, if you have Excel open, you may want to test this out. So, because a lot of people miss this part. Um, you click on a cell inside of a table, and then you go to the data tab, and then under sort and filter, um, you click on advanced, and then it'll, that'll bring up the advanced filter dialog box, which is what you'll see right here. All right, and then you'll see that you can click on the um, desire action right here. It says filter filtering list. You can filter in place or you can say copy to filter to another location. Here is where you choose your list range, your criteria range, and then the copy to. All right. So now we're going to move on to uh, manipulating data with database functions. And here is all the database functions here. Dsum, Daverage, Dmin, Dmax, Dcount. Um, database functions analyze data for selected records, selected records in a data set. And they have three arguments. Database, field, and criteria. All right, a database is an entire data set. A field is the column that contains the values operated by the function, and a criteria defines the conditions to be met by the function. So here are all the examples of the uh, database functions. And here, here we go. DSUM adds values to match specified conditions. Here 
is DSUM, and again, they all have the same arguments, database, field, criteria. The average, same deal, sorry. Equals the average, same arguments, database, field, criteria. Dmax, database, field, criteria. All right, we also have Dmin, which identifies the lowest value that matches specified conditions. Again, same arguments. It's equals Dmin. The arguments are database, field, criteria, and dcount which counts the cells that contain numbers that match specified conditions. Here's an example of the dsum argument, I mean the, um, the dsum function with all those arguments answered. So it says it equals dsum. In this example, we have A6 through E9. And then you can see down here is it using um, D average, D min, I mean D, D max, D min, and D count. And they all have the same arguments. Okay, so you can just visualize this with substitute D sum and you can put in D average and it'll give you all these different numbers. All right, now we're gonna talk about financial functions. PV function, the FV function, um, NPV, NPER, and a rate function. PV, or present value, calculates the total present or the current value of an investment with a fixed rate. Uh, a specified number of payment periods and a series of identical payments that will be made in the future, okay? FV, or future value, calculates the future value of an investment given a fixed interest rate term and identical periodic payments. NPV, or net present value, calculates the net present value of an investment given a fixed rate and future payments that may be identical or different. So we, here, we have here the function equals PV, and we have all the arguments. Again, rate, number of payments, I mean, sorry, number of payment periods, payment, future value, and optional type. Well, these both are optional arguments, FV and type. For FV, same arguments equals FV, rate, number of payment periods, um, payment, and then the optional arguments, present value and type. Net present value equals NPV, and you're looking for the rate, value one, value two. All right, this slide shows examples of um, PV and FV and NPV, and how they've been applied to this, this worksheet here. So, um, so remember, the arguments for PV is rate, number of payment periods, and payment. So we have B6, which is the rate. B5, this is the number of years, or the number of payment periods, which is 20 years. And then we have B4, which is the, um, the payment amount for this right here, it's a $100,000 payment. So it's at the present value is $1,256,221. Here's an example of a future value as well. Um, now, additional financial functions, um, NPER, this calculates the number of payments for an investment or loan given a fixed interest rate.
periodic payment and present value. The arguments are equals, I mean, the function is equals NPER. It's looking for the rate, payment, present value with the optional arguments or future value and type. Um, the next function is rate. This calculates the periodic rate of an investment or loan given a number of payment periods, payments or present value. And this function is equals rate. And here are the arguments. Number of payment periods, payment, present value, and optional arguments, future value, and type. And here we have an example of that. Number of payment periods, you see the first argument is the rate. And you see in this example, B3, which is 5.24, is divided by 12. Okay, that's to get the rate for the number of periods, because you have to get the uh, periodic rate. So you have to take your whole interest rate and then divide that by the number of payments per year. So basically, they want to know what you're paying um, in interest every month. That's why you divide right here. That's his first argument. And then the next one is payment, which is in B5. You see the payment is $694.28. And the argument, there's a negative in front of B5. That's because you know you want to you want your payment to reflect as a positive figure, even though this is reflecting debt. So you have to put a negative in front of it to reflect it as positive. Okay, that's something else that you all have to keep in mind too. So you you lost some points with that. Um, some people lost some points with that the last exam. And um, B two, the last argument, which is present value. And you know it's saying that the present value of this current loan is thirty thousand. So. And then the answer was 48, meaning it's going to take you 48 payments to pay off this loan of a monthly payment of 694. All right. And here you have the example of rate. It was rate B11 multiplied by B12, which is the number of uh, periods in a year or 12 months in a year multiplied by 12, I mean, multiplied by four. Okay. And then the payment again with a negative in front of it. So it can reflect as a positive in Excel. And the present value up 30,000. And it returned a rate at 0.44. That's your periodic rate. All right, now we're going to move on to formulas in the amortization table using IP, the IPMT function, using the PPMT function, using the cumulative inter, interest payment function and the cumulative principal function. All right, so how many of you have seen a table like this before, an amortization table? How many of you have student loans? Okay, this is something that you're gonna see after you graduate. Okay, you're going to see how many of you have ever financed a car or something? You know, I know you guys are young. You're not you may not be at that point in your lives yet. But whenever you finance something and you, you have to pay it off in monthly installments, part of your documentation is going to be what's called a loan amortization table. And basically, this breaks down what you're paying in interest and your principal um, every payment. OK. Um, so this is what this table is showing you up here. You know, we have your loan, your APR, your number of years and the number of payments per year. And then, you know, it shows you you started with a thirty thousand dollar balance. Your monthly payment stays the same. Six hundred sixty dollars, fifty nine cents. But part of your payment is going to go to interest to pay back your loan. So $68 of it is going to go towards the interest. This is how much went towards your principal. And then this now is your new ending balance. Okay. And now here's an example of cumulative interest. Okay. 
IPMT shows you an individual interest for a payment. Cumulative interest shows you like a cumulative amount of interest you paid. Okay. So you'll get this amortization table in your documentation anytime you buy a home, a car, you take out any type of loan, you're going to get something like this. It's going to break down what you're paying in interest in principal per payment. Okay. Excel has functions built in where you can do that yourself as well. IPMT calculates the periodic interest for payments for a payment period on a loan or an investment given a fixed interest rate. Here, here's the uh, function equals IPMT. Here's all the arguments. Rate. Um, period. Um, number of payment periods and present value. Here's PPMT. Calculates the principal payment for a payment period on a loan or an investment given in a fixed interest rate term or payments. And you see they both have the same arguments. All right. Um, the cumulative interest function or CUM IPMT calculates the cumulative interest through a specified payment period. You can see all the arguments here, rate, number of payment periods, present value, start period, end period, and type. Cumulative principal function calculates the cumulative principal through a specified payment period. Um, And again, here's another example of a loan amortization table. This slide only shows the, um, the interest paid. All right, so in summary, there's additional Excel functions, um, date, logical, and lookup. These include day, I mean, date, day, month, and year. We talked about if, and or are not. We talked about additional lookup functions, including index and match. We talked about database functions, the D sum, D average, D min, D max, D count. We talked about financial functions, PV, FE, NPV, NPER, rate, IPMT, PPMT, CUM, IPMT, and CUM principal. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, that was chapter seven. We're gonna move on to chapter eight. All right, so in chapter eight, we're gonna talk about statistical functions and analyzing statistics. All right, uh, we're gonna use conditional math and statistical functions create relative standing with statistical functions. Um, we're gonna measure central tendency. We're gonna talk about loading the analysis tool pack, and then you can perform analysis using the analysis tool pack, and uh, talk about creating a forecast sheet. Skills include using sum if, average if, and the count if functions. In addition to sum if, there's sum ifs, and there's average ifs. And there's count ifs, all right, and there's also and we're also going to talk about uh, math and statistical functions. All right, so here are some Excel math and statistical functions. Some if calculates the total of a range of values when a specified condition is is met. All right, um, so when you use some average and the count functions, Excel calculates their respective total. The, mathematic, the mathematical average and the number of values for all values in a range specified in the function's arguments. Um, so the math and statistical functions categories contain related functions. Again, sum if, average if, count if, 
some ifs, average ifs, and count ifs that perform similar conditions, I mean, similar calculations, but based on conditions. All right, the sum if function is a statistical function to the sum function, except that it calculates the total of a range of values when a specified condition is met. So, right, same thing with the average if. The average if function calculates the average or the arithmetic, the arithmetic mean of a cell's range within when, I'm sorry, when all specified conditions are met. You can see the, um, the formulas all have the same arguments equals average ifs, average range, criteria range one, criteria, criteria one, criteria range two, criteria two. Sum is the same thing, you get the sum range, then you get the criteria range one, criteria one, criteria range two, criteria two, the same thing with count if. Um, count if is similar to the count function, except that it calculates the number of cells in a range when it meets a specified condition. All right, so some ifs calculate a value, a, the total value of cells in a range that meet multiple criteria. Okay, so some if calculates a range on a specified condition, some ifs calculates a range on multiple criteria. All right, so again, it's some ifs, average ifs, count ifs. All right, so this slide here shows an example of those functions in use. In use. Yep, no problem. So right here we have equal sum f, open parentheses, C2, which is here, to C13. So it first got my range. Then the second argument is high school high schools in that range and then it says then it's looking for the sum of d2 to d13 and then it gave you gave us the sum of the total salary of high school teachers and it's 247,447 you can see the same example of average ifs okay first argument I found a range c2 c13 same thing, high school was the second argument, and then where it's going to display, well, what is it going to average is the second argument, I mean the third argument, and it's taking the average of D2 to D13 and showing us the average salary of high school teachers is $49,489. Now you can see what count if does. Count if just counts how many people are high school teachers. Some ifs, you see, we have multiple conditions in this. Some ifs right here, this example, you know, they're looking for a high school teacher in, in the township of Jackson. Okay, average ifs, they're looking for the same thing. But you see the difference is, you know, the first one is some if, and the second one is some ifs. So if there's multiple conditions, you know, you got to add that S, okay? And you can see right here, count ifs. And this is counting how many high school teachers are in the township of Jackson. And it said two. The first count if, just count it how many high school teachers, right? Now we're going to talk about rank and percentile. I mean, percent rank functions and the quartile and the percentile functions. Um, Excel contains several ranking functions. The rank EQ function identifies a value's rank within a list of values and it, it uh, uh, omits the next rank when a tie exists. The rank average function identifies a rank of a value but assigns the average rank when identical values exist 
Okay, the arguments for these two functions are um, the number right here you see equals, the, the function starts with equals rank EQ or rank dot EQ, open parentheses, the first argument is number. And the, ar the number argument specifies the cell containing the value you want to rank. The second argument is ref. The ref argument specifies the range of values that you want to identify, that you want to use to identify the rankings. And then you see the optional argument order. And this enables you to specify how you want to rank the values. The implied default is zero for descending order and for any non-zero value is um, will be in, um, in ascending order. So here we have an example in this slide. These two folks have the same salary. So they gave um, a rank EQ of eight and then a rank average of 8.5. Okay. Now additional ranking functions include percent rank dot inc. This displays a values rank as a percentile of a range where values range from zero to one in inclusive. Okay. Um, the arguments are percent rank dot ink um, the first argument is array the array argument specifies the range that contains the values to compare the, the second argument is X the X argument specifies the individual cell and then you have the optional argument right here significance the um, the significance optional argument designates the number of significant um, digits Okay, for um, to be precise. All right, now we have also percent rank dot exc. This displays a, a values ranks as a percentile in a range where values range from zero to one exclusive. And here's just an example of those formulas used or functions used. All right, so the next two ranking functions that use quartiles, or quartiles means dividing into four groups. The quartile inc function, it identifies a value at a, at a specific quartile for a data set, including um, quartile zero for the lowest value and quartile, and quartile four for the, high, the highest value in the data set. All right, um, the quartile dot exe function identifies a value at a specific quartile for a data set excluding quartile zero for the lowest value and quartile four for the highest value all right the arguments are um, right here equals quartile dot inc for the function open parentheses array for the first argument the array argument specifies the range of values and then a quart argument specifies the quartile from zero to four, where zero and one are only allowed in the ink version. Okay. And here we have an example of these, both in column D um, which has the ranks. You can see the salaries are ranked in ascending order. Okay, so um, additional functions, ranking functions, it's percentile.inc function. It identifies a value at a specific percentile, including zero and one. And percentile.exe 
identifies the value at a specific percentile excluding zero and one. All right, so the arguments for this, again, is percentile that inc for the function, open parentheses, array. The array argument, again, is it an, uh, um, an array. The array argument specifies the range of values. And the k argument specifies the percentile from zero to one. And it, just like the previous example, um, Just like the previous example, zero and one can only be is only allowed in the percentile that inc function. On this side, so is an example. All right, now we're going to talk about uh, measuring central central tendency um, using standard deviation using variance, using the, the corral function, and using the frequency function. All right, um, when you're calculating central tendencies, there are two groups you consider. One is the population. A population um, in statisticals and, and stats refers to a data set that contains all the data, and um, you need to consider the, the sample. A sample is a smaller portion of the population Central tendency functions um, also um, is variance. This measures a data set's dispersion. And then standard deviation measures how far the data sample is spread around the mean. Or spread around the mean or spread around the average. So Excel has four versions of functions to calculate these two central tendencies. Central tendencies, okay. Um, here are two versions of each. Standard deviation dot p. This calculates a standard deviation based on population. And standard deviation dot s. It calculates a standard deviation based on a sample of the population. And the arguments for these two functions are. Um, the first argument specifies the range of values used to calculate the standard deviation. And the second argument isn't commonly used. All right. Here, we're going to move on to the variance functions. Variance.p calculates the variance based on the population. And variance dot s function calculates the variance based on a sample of the population. So this argument, I mean this function is pretty simple. You see we have op equals standard deviation dot s and we just put in the first argument which is number one or a range of cells. In this case <coughs> c4 to C53, which you can't see on a screen, but it gives a standard deviation of 181, and then a variance right here. So this is a sample of 50 students and um, so because this is a sample, um, dot S was used here. Okay. Now, um, the corel or the correlation function determines the strength of a relationship between two variables. Like for example, um, the correlation between driving drunk and car accidents. Okay. Um, people would use this argument or this, this, this function in Excel to determine something like that. 
Um, Excel has a function that measures cor correlations between two variables. Mm. The Corel function, short for, short for correlation coefficient, helps determine the strength of a relationship between two variables when used to compare data sets. Um, the function will return a value between one, I mean between negative one and one. All right, so right here is an example of the correlation between salary and credit score. Okay, this particular data sheet is saying, you know, the higher the salary, the higher the credit score you have, which isn't necessarily true. Um, I will say, you know, if you have a 450 credit score, you need to work on that. Okay, but this is is showing basically an example of, you know, if you had to make a point, lower salaries equals lower credit score. Basically, credit score is all based on your payment history. All right, now uh, more more for mo uh, measuring central tendency frequency determines the frequency di distribution of a data set. So in here, basically, frequency is going to count the amount of time something happened. So in this example. Um, the you'll see the salary of thirty nine thousand two hundred and three dollars came up twelve times. The salary of fifty one thousand seven hundred and seventy five dollars came up thirteen times. And here's the argument for frequency it's equals. I mean, um, here's the uh, the formula for the frequency function equals frequency. And the first argument is looking for the data array. Here in the example, the data array is C three through C52. And then the second argument is the Benz array. And the Benz array argument is the uh, range of numbers that specify the bins in which the data should be counted. So here, it has H4 to H6. So it's counting, it's, it's looking for the frequency of these numbers or these bins of numbers. All right, now we're going to talk about loading the analysis tool pack. Um, in order to get to, get to the analysis tool pack, um, because you will need to use, you'll, you'll need to perform an analysis using... Um, what's called ANOVA or covariance. In Excel, you'll need to do this. You'll need to um, enable the analysis tool pack. You'll, you can get there from the file tab, and then you go to options, and then you'll see add-ons on the left-hand side. And then um, once you select add-ons, you'll see inside the manage box, you'll see something that says go, and then you'll click on the analysis tool pack, and it'll bring you, this is what the screen looks like. Once you have the analysis tool pack added in Excel, you can see it under the data tab, under the analysis group. Okay, that's important to note. Again, you get the data, you, you find the data analysis tool pack under file and options, then you click on add-ons, okay, or add-ins. All right, um, now we're gonna move on to talking about performing an analysis of variance or ANOVA calculating covariance and creating a histogram. All right, um, this is an example of your results of ANOVA. <coughs> this is what, um, this is ANOVA single factor. This is what you should be seeing when you run this. ANOVA is a statistical hypothesis test that helps determine if samples of data were taken from the same population. Okay, um, in practical use, it can be used to accept or reject a, hypo a, a hypothesis, all right? You would see this when you, if you decide to go for like your PhD and you need to defend your thesis and if someone wants to make sure that the data that you're used that you used is um, 
good data, they would use a Nova on your population data set to make sure that you're, you are in fact using that population, all right? Um, so right here is an example of a, um, a Nova report using the analysis tool pack. Um, So right here, this example is a um, um, ANOVA report using a single factor, ANOVA about a school system's um, high school students. And basically this is what all this stuff means. You see the report, I have these columns it says SS, DF, MS, F, P value, and F crit. It's basically what all that stuff means. Sum of squares, or SS, sum of squares of the data points in the sample, uh, degrees of freedom, MS is the mean square, F is the F ratio. And again, you'll see all these things here in the, in the ANOVA report. So here's p-value, which is the probability of the population being um, similar to the sample. And then um, f-crit, or the critical value of f, this is used to determine if the f underscore test is significant. You don't need to worry about remembering this stuff right here. Just get stuff to know. Um, covariance is similar to correlation. It's a measure of how two sets of data vary simultaneously. Um, Excel has covariance P and covariance S that, can, that you can use to calculate covariance. And there's also a covariance reporting feature included in the analysis tool pack. All right, so in, to, in order to do that, you would click on the data tab in the analysis group, then click on the data analysis to display the, the data analysis box. Again, you, you gotta have data, the, you gotta have the data analysis tool pack installed first. And remember, you get there from file option add-ins. All right, and then you select covariance and click okay. And then um, you, you, you'll, it'll ask you for an input range and then you can select group by columns or group by rows, depending on the organization of the data. The first row contains the values, and then you check labels in the first row, check boxes selected, and then you select the option, the output option, then you click OK. So here in this example is basically saying that um, more days of schools missed by students, the lower their SAT scores. Okay, we would expect a negative relationship, which is in, which is indicated here. So the more days that you miss of school, the lower you scored on your SAT. A histogram is a visual display of tabulated frequencies. All right, you can use the analysis tool pack to create a histogram. It's kind of like using frequency using the frequency function and that it requires bends to tabulate the data and it will return a frequency distribution table. So in order to create a histogram, you got to go to the data tab and the analysis group and then you click on data analysis to display the data analysis dialog box. And again, I can't stress this enough. You won't get data analysis unless you install data analysis or add it in into your Excel. And again, file options, add-ins, in order to add the data analysis, okay? Um, and then you do the same thing, you enter the input range, then you enter the bin range into the bin box, 
you click on the labels box, then you select the output options of your choice, and then you can select an output option and then click OK. This slide shows the, uh, is in a frequency distribution table from which this histogram was created. So it's created right from this table right here. Okay, now we're going to move on to talking about creating a forecast sheet. You can find where to create a forecast sheet under the data tab and then in the forecast group and then you can click on forecast sheet. Um, a forecast worksheet details trends based on historical data and this example is tracking the average SAT scores over over years as they compare to average teacher salaries. Um, the forecast sheet feature will generate a chart and core in a also a corresponding table to provide a future forecast based on given data. In order to create a forecast worksheet, you need to sort the data in chronological order. Then you select a data range for the desired forecast. Then you go to the data tab and then you go to the forecast group and then you click on forecast sheet. And then you select the desired forecast in and then you click create as you can see right here. All right, looking at this slide, the blue line represents the historical data based on the shaded table, and the orange lines represent the forecast results. In summary, additional Excel functions include math and statistical related functions, sum if, average if, count if, some ifs, average ifs and count ifs, relative standing functions, which forms uh, various groups, um, rank, percent rank, quartile, and percentile, descriptive statistical functions, standard deviation, variance, correlation, and frequency, and inferential statistical, statistical functions, ANOVA, covariance, histograms, and forecast sheets. Any questions? All right, give me a second while I set up on the desktop for um, for something. Is that the audio PowerPoint? And Megan, right? Yes. I'm gonna look into that thing you told me about. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties.
All right, this is chapter seven, audio PowerPoint. In chapter seven, you will learn how to manipulate data using date, logical, lookup, database and financial functions. The objectives for this chapter are use date functions, create a nested logical function, use advanced lookup functions, apply advanced filtering, manipulate data with database functions, use financial functions, create a loan amortization table. In this section, the skills include use the year frac function, use the days function, use the date, year and month functions, use other date functions. Excel's date and time category includes a variety of date and time functions. The days function calculates the number of days between two dates where the most recent date is entered in the end date argument and the older date is entered in the start date argument. The year frac function calculates the fraction of a year between two dates based on the number of whole days using the start date and end date arguments. Additional date and time functions are discussed on the next slide. Additional date and time functions. The day function displays the day 1 through 31 within a given date. The month function displays the month 1 through 12 for a specific date. The year function displays the year for a specific date. In this section, the skills include create a nested if function, use the and function, nest an and function, nest an or or not function. A nested function is a function that is embedded within an argument of another function. In an earlier chapter, you learned about the if logical function which enables you to test two outcomes for a situation. What happens if there are three or more outcomes? The example in the text concerns the payment of a bonus based on employee's time with a company. Although there are three dates that determine the percent of the bonus, we only have to test two. Do you know why? The figure on the left shows the worksheet and the figure on the right shows a flow chart picturing the logic necessary to make the correct determination. Notice that there are two if functions, which are nested. Be sure you understand the structure of the flowchart. We see the same flowchart as on the previous slide, but it now contains the cell references. The nested if statement is shown on the right. As you can see, one if function is nested within the other if function. You can directly enter this line in the formula bar or use the function arguments dialog box to construct it. Excel provides three additional functions to help in the construction of complex conditions. These are the AND function, which accepts two or more logical tests and displays true if all conditions are true or false if any one of the conditions is false. The OR function evaluates to true if any of the conditions are true and returns false only if all conditions are false. The NOT function evaluates only one logical test and reverses the truth of the logical test. This slide shows the AND function is used in column E. Adams and Lang are the only managers who earn less than $70,000. Although Crandall is a manager, she earns more than $70,000. Although Lenz earns only $49,750, he is not a manager. Study the last three columns so that you understand the results for each worker. In this section, the skills include create a lookup field, use the index function, use the match function. In an earlier chapter, you learned how to use the VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP functions to look up a value, compare it to a lookup table, and then return a result from the lookup table. Two other lookup functions that are helpful are index and match. The index function returns a value at the intersection of a specified row and column of an array. Equal sign index parentheses array comma row underscore num comma bracket column underscore num 
bracket parentheses. The figure shows that the index finds the intersection of the third row and second column in the array of names and sales. In this case, cell B4 is at that intersection within the range. The index function then returns the data contained in that cell, which is $8,454. The match function searches through a range for a specific value and returns the relative position of that value within the range. Equal sign match parentheses lookup underscore value comma lookup underscore array comma bracket match underscore type bracket parentheses. The figure shows that the match function in cell B8 looks up the value stored in cell B7 $8,454, compares it to the range B2 through B5, and then finds an exact match on the third row of that range. Therefore, the match function displays 3. In this section, the skills include create criteria and output ranges, apply an advanced filter, Data becomes more useful in decision making when you can filter the records into a subset of data that meets specific conditions. A criteria range is a group of two or more adjacent cells that specifies the conditions used to control the results of a filter. A criteria range must contain at least two rows and one column, where the first row contains the column labels as they appear in the dataset and the second row contains the conditions, values, used to filter the dataset. For example, a manager might want to identify account reps who earn more than $30,000 in Chicago. The slide shows the original dataset, criteria range, and copy of records that meet these three conditions. Note, unlike your previous work with filters, the original dataset is still visible and a copy of only those records that meet these conditions are copied to another location. Notice an additional row has been added to the criteria and the results have increased. The third row created another filter for account reps who live in Atlanta with no salary specified. The results of both queries use the OR condition and that is why there are more results. To apply the advanced filter, you click a cell in the data table. On the data tab in the sort and filter group, click advanced to display the advanced filter dialog box. Click the desired action, filter the list, in place or copy to another location. Ensure the list range displays the range containing the original data set, including the column headings. Enter the criteria range, including the criteria labels in the criteria range box. Specify the copy to range if you selected copy to another location. Enter only the starting row. Click OK. Note, to perform the advanced filter for the OR condition, you must select all three rows of the criteria range. The column labels, the row containing the criteria for Chicago account reps earning more than $30,000, and the row containing criteria for Atlanta account reps. In this section, the skills include use the dsum function, use the dAverage function, use the dmin function, use the dmax function, use the dcount function. Database functions analyze data for selected records in a dataset, and they have three arguments, database, field, and criteria. The database argument is the entire dataset including column labels and all data on which the function operates. The field argument is the column that contains the values operated on by the function. This can be the name of the column in quotation marks or the column number. The criteria argument defines the conditions to be met by the function. This range must contain at least one column label and a cell below the label that specifies the condition. Excel database functions are the dsum function adds the values in a column that match conditions specified in a criteria range. The dAverage function determines the arithmetic mean or average of values in a column that match conditions specified in a criteria range. The dmax function identifies the highest value in a column that matches specified conditions in a criteria range. 
Additional database functions are discussed on the next slide. Excel database functions are the dmin function identifies the lowest value in a column that matches specified conditions in a criteria range. The dcount function counts the cells that contain numbers in a column that match specified conditions in a criteria range. Note, dcount excludes missing values. This slide shows the results of applying the various database functions. It specifically shows the dsum function, but all the other functions, average, max, min, and count, have the same arguments. A6 colon E19 comma E6 comma A22 colon E23. In this section, the skills include use the PV function, use the FV function, use the NPV function, use the NPER function, use the rate function. Excel has several financial functions. The PV, present value function, calculates the total present, current value of an investment with a fixed rate, specified number of payment periods, and a series of identical payments that will be made in the future. The FV, future value function, calculates the future value of an investment, given a fixed interest rate, term, and identical periodic payments. The NPV, net present value function, calculates the net present value of an investment, given a fixed rate, rate of return, and future payments that may be identical or different. Additional financial functions are discussed on another slide. This slide shows specific examples of how the present value, PV, future value, FV, and net present value, NPV, functions have been applied in a worksheet. Excel has several financial functions. The NPER, number of periods function, calculates the number of payment periods for an investment or loan given a fixed interest rate, periodic payment, and present value. The rate function calculates the periodic rate for an investment or loan given the number of payment periods, a fixed periodic payment, and present value. This slide shows specific examples of how the number of periods, NPER, and rate, rate functions, have been applied in a worksheet. In this section, the skills include enter formulas in the amortization table, use the IPMT function, use the PPMT function, use the CUM IPMT function, use the CUM PRINC function. The financial functions that were discussed in the previous objective yield a single result. Suppose you want to create a payment schedule that shows the interest per payment period, principal repayment for each payment, and remaining balance after each payment is made. This is called a loan amortization table, and a partial table is shown in the slide. Because this example is for a car loan over four years or 48 monthly payments, the complete schedule cannot be viewed in its entirety. Let's look at the financial functions that are needed to generate this amortization table. Additional Excel financial functions. The IPMT function calculates the periodic interest for a specified payment period on a loan or an investment given a fixed interest rate, specified term, and identical periodic payments. The PPMT function calculates the principal payment for a specified payment period on a loan or an investment, given a fixed interest rate, specified term, and identical periodic payments. The arguments for these two functions are, the rate argument is the periodic interest rate. If the APR is 6% and the payments are made monthly, then the rate is 6% divided by 12 or 0.5%. The PER argument is the specific payment or investment period to use to calculate the interest where the first payment period is 1. The NPER argument represents the total number of payment or investment periods. With a four-year loan consisting of monthly payments, the number of payment periods is 48. The PV argument represents the present value of the loan or investment. The optional FV argument represents the future value of the loan or investment. If you omit this argument, Excel defaults to zero. 
the optional type argument represents the timing of the payments. Enter 0 if the payments are made at the end of the period, or enter 1 if the payments are made at the beginning. Additional financial functions are discussed on the next slide. Additional Excel Financial Functions The CUMIPMT function calculates the cumulative interest through a specified payment period. The CUMPRINC function calculates the cumulative principal through a specified payment period. The only two new arguments are the start underscore period argument, which specifies the first period you want to start accumulating the interest, and the end underscore period argument, which specifies the last payment period you want to include. The amortization table is shown once again so you can see how the various functions were applied. In the chapter, we explored the application of additional Excel functions in three basic areas, date, logical, and lookup related functions, which enabled us to parse date information, form complex conditional statements, and add some lookup features. Date day, month, and year, if, and, or, and not, index and match, database-related functions, which enabled us to perform calculations on cell ranges by specifying criteria, dsum, dAverage, dmin and dmax, and dcount. Financial-related functions, which hopefully gave us some insight into the mysteries of loans and how they are determined, PV, FV, NPV, NPER, rate, IPMT, PPMT, CUMIPMT, and CUMPRINC. It is important to understand how to effectively use these additional Excel functions. Are there any questions? All right, now we're going to do chapter eight, and that will be the end of the night. Exploring Microsoft Office 2016. In Chapter 8, you will learn how to employ statistical functions to analyze data for decision making. The objectives for this chapter are use conditional math and statistical functions, calculate relative standing with statistical functions, measure central tendency, load the analysis tool pack. Perform analysis using the analysis tool pack. Create a forecast sheet. In this section, the skills include use the sum if, average if, and count if functions. Use the sum ifs, average ifs, and count ifs functions. Enter math and statistical functions. When you use sum, average, and count functions, Excel calculates the respective total, the mathematical average, and the number of values for all values in the range specified in the function's arguments. The math and statistical function categories contain related functions, sum if, average if, count if, sum ifs, average ifs, and count ifs, that perform similar calculations but based on a condition. The sum if function is a statistical function similar to the sum function, except that it calculates the total of a range of values when a specified condition is met. The average if function calculates the average, or arithmetic mean, of all cells in a range when a specified condition is met. The count if function is a statistical function similar to the count function, except that it calculates the number of cells in a range when a specified condition is met. Additional math and statistics functions are discussed on the next slide. The three functions discussed on the slide are similar to their counterparts on the previous slide, except multiple criteria can be used. The sum ifs function calculates the total value of cells in a range that meet multiple criteria. The average ifs function calculates the average value of cells in a range that meet multiple criteria. The count ifs function counts the number of cells in a range that meet multiple criteria.
This slide shows the application of several of the math and statistical functions discussed in the two previous slides. Take time to look at the functions to see how they are written and understand their results. To actually find these functions, Excel organizes the conditional functions in the math and statistical function categories. The sum if and sum ifs functions are math functions and are located under math and trig in the function library group. The average if, average ifs, count if, and count ifs functions are statistical functions. To locate these functions, click more functions in the function library group and then click statistical. In this section, the skills include Use the rank and percent rank functions. Use the quartile and percentile functions. Excel contains several ranking functions. The rank.eq function identifies a value's rank within a list of values, omitting the next rank when tie values exist. The rank.avg function identifies the rank of a value, but assigns an average rank when identical values exist. The arguments for these two functions are the number argument specifies the cell containing the value you want to rank. The ref argument specifies the range of values that you want to use to identify their rankings. The optional order argument enables you to specify how you want to rank the values. The implied default is zero for descending order and any non-zero value is for ascending order. This difference between these two functions is shown on the next slide. Both rank functions use column D, which has the salaries ranked in ascending order. Additional ranking functions. The percent rank.inc function displays a values rank as a percentile of the range of data in the data set. The values range from zero to one, where zero is the lowest percent rank and one is the highest. The INC indicates that zero and one are included. The percent rank.exc function is similar to percent rank.inc in that it returns a values rank as a percent, but excludes zero and one, hence the exc. The arguments for these two functions are, the array argument specifies the range that contains the values to compare. The X argument specifies an individual cell. The optional significance argument designates the number of significant digits for precision. This difference between these two functions is shown on the next slide. Both percent rank functions use column D, which has the salaries ranked in ascending order. Notice the differences, especially at the top and bottom where zero and one were included and excluded. The next two ranking functions use quartiles, dividing into four groups. The quartile.inc function identifies the value at a specific quartile for a data set, including quartile 0 for the lowest value and quartile 4 for the highest value in the data set. The quartile.exc function identifies the value at a specific quartile for a data set, excluding quartile 0 for the lowest value and quartile 4 for the highest value in the data set. The arguments for these two functions are the array argument specifies the range of values. The quart argument specifies the quartile from 0 to 4, where 0 and 1 are only allowed with the INC version. This difference between these two functions is shown on the next slide. Both quartile functions use column D, which has the salaries ranked in ascending order. Notice the differences, especially at the top and bottom where zero and one were included and excluded. The final two ranking functions use percentiles, dividing into 100 groups. The percentile.inc function identifies the value at a specific percentile for a data set, including quartile zero for the lowest value and quartile 100 for the highest value in the data set. The percentile.exc function identifies the value at a specific percentile for a data set, excluding quartile 0 for the lowest value and quartile 100 for the highest value in the data set. The arguments for these two functions are, the array argument specifies the range of values. 
The K argument specifies the percentile from 0 to 1, where 0 and 1 are only allowed with the INC version. This difference between these two functions is shown on the next slide. Both rank functions use column D, which has the salaries ranked in ascending order. Notice the differences, especially at the top where zero was included and excluded. In this section, the skills include use the standard deviation function, use the variance function, use the corel function, use the frequency function. When calculating central tendencies, there are two groups to consider. A population is a data set that contains all the data you would like to evaluate. A sample is a smaller, more manageable portion of the population. The example given in the text is all educators in the state of Pennsylvania constitute an example of a population, and a survey of 10% of the educators of each city in Pennsylvania is a sample. When dealing with statistics, determining the 10% that are surveyed is the difficult part. The two common functions for measuring central tendencies are variance is a measure of a data set's dispersion. Standard deviation is the measure of how far the data sample is spread around the mean, average. Excel provides four versions of functions to calculate these two central tendencies. We will focus on two versions of each. Standard deviation functions. The stdev.p function calculates the standard deviation based on the population. The stdev.s function calculates the standard deviation based on a sample of the population. The arguments for these two functions are, the first argument specifies the range of values used to calculate the standard deviation. The second argument is not commonly used. Variance functions. The var.p function calculates the variance based on the population. The var.s function calculates the variance based on a sample of the population. Both functions use column C, which contains the test scores. Notice that the standard deviation only uses one argument, which is the test scores. This is a sample of 50 students, so the S versions of STDEV and VAR are used. You have heard many times about a relationship, correlation, between two variables. For example, the correlation between smoking and cancer. Excel has a function that measures correlations between two variables. The range for the coefficient of correlation is negative 1 to 1. The stronger the relationship, the closer the coefficient of correlation is to negative 1 or 1. You might expect a coefficient of correlation between the hours spent studying and the grades on a test would have a value close to 1. On the other hand, the coefficient of correlation between the speed the cars are driven and the average miles per gallon would have a value close to negative 1. What would you expect the coefficient of correlation between a person's height and their income? The CORREL function, short for correlation coefficient, helps determine the strength of a relationship between two variables. When used to compare data sets, the function will return a value between negative 1 and 1. As seen in the formula bar, we are comparing columns A and B, which represent salary and credit score. As you can see, there is a strong correlation between salaries and credit scores. The frequency distribution is a meaningful descriptive tool because it determines how often a set of numbers appears within a data set. The frequency function is a descriptive statistical function in Excel that determines the frequency distribution of a data set. The two arguments for the function are, the data array is the range of cells that contain the values that are being evaluated for frequency of occurrence. The bins array argument is the range of numbers that specify the bins in which the data should be counted. As seen in the formula bar, we are using column C, which contains salaries, and creating three bins based on quartiles and the corresponding salaries in column H. We see that there are 12 people in the first quartile, and 13 in the second and third quartiles. 
In this section, the skills include load the analysis tool pack. As you learned in Chapter 6, add-ins are programs that can be added to Excel to provide enhanced functionality. The Analysis Tool Pack is an add-in program that provides statistical analysis tools specifically for performing an analysis of variance, or ANOVA, and covariance, and creating a histogram. To enable the Analysis Tool Pack add-in, you click the File tab and click Options. Select Add-ins on the left side. Ensure that Excel add-ins is selected in the Manage box and click Go. Click the Analysis Tool Pack checkbox to select it and click OK. In this section, the skills include Perform Analysis of Variance, ANOVA, Calculate Covariance, Create a Histogram. ANOVA is a statistical hypothesis test that helps determine if samples of data were taken from the same population. In practical use, it can be used to accept or reject a hypothesis. There is no one function to calculate ANOVA in Excel. However, we will create an ANOVA report using the Analysis Tool Pack. One of the three types of ANOVA, we will create an ANOVA report using a single factor ANOVA about a school system's high school students. To use the Analysis Tool Pack to create a single factor ANOVA report, on the Data tab in the Analysis group, click Data Analysis to display the Data Analysis dialog box. Select ANOVA Single Factor and click OK. Click the Input Range Selection box and select the range of data you want to analyze. Select either Grouped by Columns or Grouped by Rows based on your data layout. Choose the default Alpha 0.05, meaning there is a 5% chance of rejecting the Null Hypothesis. Select an Output option and click OK. This slide shows the result of an ANOVA test, and the table on the right shows how to interpret the results. Don't worry, this will not be on the final. Covariance is similar to correlation. It is a measure of how two sets of data vary simultaneously. In Excel, there are covariance.p and covariance.s functions that can calculate covariance, and there is also a covariance reporting feature included in the Analysis Tool Pack. To create a covariance report, on the Data tab in the Analysis group, click Data Analysis to display the Data Analysis dialog box. Select Covariance and click OK. Click the Input Range Selection box and select the range of the data you want to analyze. Select Grouped by Columns or Grouped by Rows, depending on the organization of the dataset. If the first row contains labels, check Labels in the first row checkbox to select it. Select an Output option and click OK. In this example, we are hypothesizing that the more days of schools missed by students, the lower the students' SAT scores. We would expect a negative relationship, which is indicated in the results shown in the slide. A histogram is a visual display of tabulated frequencies. We will use the Analysis Tool Pack to create a histogram. Creating a histogram is somewhat similar to using the Frequency function in that it requires bins to tabulate the data and will return a frequency distribution table. To create a histogram, on the Data tab in the Analysis group, click Data Analysis to display the Data Analysis dialog box. Enter the Input Range in the Input Range box. Enter the Bin Range in the Bin Range box. Click the Labels box. Select the Output options of your choice. Select an Output option and click OK. Shown in this slide is the Frequency Distribution table from which the histogram is created. In this section, the skills include Create a Forecast Sheet, Excel 2016 offers a new feature that has the ability to create a forecast worksheet to detail trends based on historical data. In this example, we are going to track average SAT scores over the years as they compare to average teacher salaries. The forecast sheet feature will generate a chart and corresponding table to provide a future forecast based on given data. To create a forecast worksheet, 
you sort the data in chronological order. Select the data range for the desired forecast. On the Data tab in the Forecast group, click Forecast Sheet. Set the desired forecast end. Click Create. Looking at the slide, the blue line represents the historical data based on the shaded table and the orange lines represent the forecasted results. In this chapter, we explored the application of additional Excel functions in several areas. Math and statistical related functions, which enabled us to calculate statistics based on specified criteria, sum if, average if, count if, sum ifs, average ifs, and count ifs. Relative standing functions, which formed various groups, rank, percent rank, quartile, and percentile. Descriptive statistical functions, which enabled us to examine central tendencies, STDEV, VAR, C-O-R-R-E-L, and frequency. Inferential statistical functions, which enabled us to make inferences based on samples and populations, ANOVA, covariance, histograms, and forecast sheets. It is important to understand how to use statistical functions to analyze data. Are there any questions? Anyone have any questions? All right, beautiful folks. See you next week.